Hello, everybody. Welcome to our inaugural Hangout. This is the, a brand new Hangout that we're doing here on DeepAstronomy.com and the Deep Astronomy YouTube channel called Telescope Talk. This is a Hangout that we I have been wanting to do for a really, really long time. This is, I just feel like I've been doing astronomy videos on Deep Astronomy for 10 years now. And I always get a, a subset of people who want to learn more about the the uh, the hobby of amateur astronomy, and I've always wanted to do it because I uh, I think it's an important way to get people from all walks of life introduced into looking up into the night sky, and so I'm all for that. So uh, we're going to be doing these. This is our time on Tuesdays at three o'clock Eastern and eight o'clock on the U in the UK time zone. I bring that out because my co-hosts are both from the UK, and I was able. What I tell you what kick-started this whole hangout is I do hangouts every Thursday with the double A's and with with the professional astronomers and I always saw these two guys in my chat room talking about amateur astronomy and I got to think well these guys really have a lot of cool equipment and stuff so I reached out to both of them and we are and I asked them if they'd want to do a hangout together and so they said yes and here the and so here we are doing it so joining me and and uh, let me just pull up my coat my my guests here. This is uh, Adam Smith, also known as Adam Synergy from uh, Pull Up His Lower Third. The uns he has a podcast called UnseenPodcast.com. Hi, Adam, and welcome. It's good to have. It's good hey. to see your face. Hey, Tony. Hey. Good to see you too, my friend. Yes, it's good, good to see to be you. Here. Yes. Now, for my other guest, I wish, or my other co-host, I wish I could show you his face, but uh, he doesn't have a camera yet. So what you're going to get is this really cute little icon uh, from uh, his uh, Google Plus profile. And his name is John Suffel. Hi, John. He is also from the UK. Uh, next week, we'll have a camera for him, and we will all three be up and visible. So hi, John. Hey Tony, hello Adam, hello everybody. Yeah, yeah that's that's my fluffy little dog, Nansen. What? What's his name? Nansen. Nansen. Isn't what? It? What kind of pooch is that? It's a Samoid. Oh, it's cute. He's a pain in. <laughs> he's very cute. He's yes, pretty, he's a pain. In, yeah, I get what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what you know? I lived in. So I lived in. Uh, uh, I lived in the UK for a year with my wife in Newcastle. In fact, I'm wearing my Newcastle shirt today. There it is right there. Uh, and uh, one of the things I noticed about people from the UK is they love dogs. I love my dog, too. I have a nice, uh, I have a nice uh, uh, pit bull mix right next to me here. But uh, you guys really love your dogs. I mean, you guys take it to a whole different level out there. It's amazing to watch you guys with your... Oh, wait. And as, as, I, as I... Oh, look. Is he a pit bull? Or I guess you call them staffies out there, right? Staffordshire Bull Terrier, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he's nice. What's his name? Tyke. Tyke. Uh, mine's Panther, and yeah, he's, just... he's sleeping over there, but if I go to show him to you, it's going to mess up my setup. So. <laughs> John knows what a tyke is. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> oh, wait. Put him, I didn't have you up. Put him up over time. Can you do it? Oh. Yeah. There you go. Sorry about that, guys. I'm still getting used to my camera angles here. Yeah, there he is. Oh, man. He's a cutie. How old is he? I'm not ex exactly sure because uh, I adopted him. I think he's about five. Ah, okay. Yeah, we adopted uh, Panther too. And he's—I uh, think he was three. They—they they, the way they estimate it is they look at his teeth and they try to look, they try to get a rough age based on all kinds of stuff. I'm hearing some some toy playing with too, so that's really cool. <laughs> it looks like a seal. Astro B is like looking like a seal, which brings me to w what we want you guys to do during this hangout. I am broadcasting. I think on four different platforms right now. I am I am, I am live streaming this hangout on YouTube, which I'm seeing the live chat here uh, right next to us. I'm also live streaming on twitch.tv slash deep astronomy. I'm looking at that live chat as well. I'm also on Facebook and uh, hopefully the, uh, the live stream is going there. I'm about to get to that uh, in just a minute. And oh, I'm seeing some I'm seeing some comments here now. So, yes, I, I do see the comments on Facebook. And finally, Periscope. I'm also doing it on that as well. So, all kinds of ways to interact with us and talk to us and, and leave questions. So, I hope that you guys will do that while we're going on. Um, so, we're going to, I think with this inaugural episode, what we're going to try and do is, is there a dog playing with a toy back there somewhere? I think that's John's budgie. 
Oh, yeah, it could be my budgie. Oh, you've got a budgie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so that's that sound, folks. That's that sound. Um, all right, so we will... <laughs> so we will. Well, so what I guess I, I should probably do is introduce some of the... We, we're still working on this, obviously. So there's going to be some tweaks and and moves to the, to the format of this Hangout. But we want to... I would like this to be an introduction into... Uh, amateur astronomy for those who maybe have never uh, been involved in amateur astronomy want to know what it's like to what the hobby is like how expensive is it how intimidating is it um, what do they have to know to do it um, but I also want to make I want to give a place for the amateur or the advanced amateurs as well so if it turns out that most of the feedback we get happens to be on the advanced level we'll certainly go there as well otherwise um, we'll I'd, I'd like to try and start by being at the beginning level so Today's hangout topic is how to get started in amateur astronomer, amateur astronomy. So I thought we, since this is our first episode, that both Adam, John, and I will, all three of us will introduce ourselves, maybe give us a little bit of background into what our expertise is, how long we've been doing amateur astronomy, and maybe just a little bit about what qualifies us to talk to you about this stuff. So I'll start with you, Adam. And since you're right here, go ahead and just introduce yourself. Talk a little bit about who you are and all that. Hi, I'm Adam. I live in Grimsby in Lincolnshire in the UK. I am, by training, a biologist. I have a, a degree in biology, so I'm a scientist. I love science. I fell in love with the universe largely through the uh, Hubble Space Telescope <laughs> Good. and the internet, and the internet uh, back in the 1990s, and since then I haven't stopped looking at the sky. Basically, it's, and how long? A, a how long have you been? Mind. How long have you been doing this? How long have you been an amateur? How long? How long would you consider yourself an amateur astronomer? Properly, probably only about 20 years. But before then, I mean, I, I had friends that did astronomy at university. I used to go to the uh, observatory at university and hang out with them and look at Andromeda. I've used telescopes most of my life. I'm nearly 50 now, so I've, I do have a, a lot. Oh, of we're telling things. our age now, are we? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> no, I can't do that. I just turned 55. Okay, I did it. I just did that. So, yeah. I just So now we're all a bunch of old guys. How about you, John? You're young, right? You're like 23? Oh, I wish. <laughs> Talk a little bit about what your background is so we can kind of get a sense of what you're up to. Well, my occupation, you could say I'm a, a computer geek or nerd. That's enough about that. I got um, interested in um, astronomy way back in 1966 when Whoa. there was um, a local solar eclipse. And being 60 years old at the time, I found it amazing that part of the sun could disappear. Obviously, it didn't really, but um, you're six year old, you're going to believe anything. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, since. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, and every interest in astronomy um, since then um, mostly helped by Patrick Moore and his um, Sky at Night series. Uh, do you know I met him? Ah. I met, I met Patrick Moore. In... Oh, yeah, and, and every. What? Are you there? Yeah, me. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I met him in 1981, and he uh, he was a um, uh, at the at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, and he um, uh, was a talk was a speaker there, and he gave me a book. Um, I'll have to go find it. It's on my bookshelf back here. Uh, sky at Night Six. He had written a lot of the books on uh, on his Sky at Night series, and he gave me Sky at Night Six. And uh, yeah, it was just we spent the whole day uh, touring Seattle together. And he was just a great guy. He was very approachable. He loved to just, you know, he was just a real gregarious guy back then. I don't know how, I, I, this was quite a while ago, obviously. But, uh, yeah, we explored the entire town of Seattle together and just went sightseeing, and it was really great. So Patrick Moore is a big hero of mine. I think he's awesome. And if you've never heard of the Sky at Night program, folks, that's another resource. We're going to talk about resources for you to use when you're getting into amateur astronomy. And the Sky at Night was a God, how long has that been running guys i mean i know they've got different hosts now but how long has that been uh, running mid 50s yeah and it was patrick moore <laughs> in the later years he started donning a monocle which i thought hilarious was hilarious but um 
Uh, now they've kind of, is it still called The Sky at Night? Oh, yes, yeah. And now they've got people like Chris Lintot on it, I believe, right? Yeah, um, Chris Lintot and, um, oh, I can't remember the name of the female presenter now. Yeah, I can't remember her name. I, I've only seen it a couple of times. But um, the the uh, the show was really good. And, and you can get it here in the U.S., but you have to watch it on, on YouTube usually, stuff like that. So Astro B's going, yeah, uh, Patrick Moore was my hero too. And <laughs> yeah, he was he was really a good guy. Okay, so we've been doing this a while. John since 66. I think he yeah, he has the record. And uh, Adam for about 20 years. Me, I've been, so I've been in doing this since I was about, I got my first telescope in high school. So it's a little, I'm kind of in between these guys. Um, I was part of a after school mentoring program that was run by a really cool guy. We, uh, we, I went to Boulder Valley public schools in Boulder, Colorado. And that budgie is really, <laughs> and, and, uh, I, they had a planetarium after school program and I got to go and work on the planetarium at the planetarium there. And I met a lot of great people there, a lot of worked with a lot of great students, got cut my teeth on making planetarium shows, but he also had a lot of great telescopes. One of them was a Criterion uh, RV6, which was a Newtonian uh, telescope. And we'll talk about what all these different telescopes are like. But you had to actually go outside, set that thing up, and look through the eyepiece and scan around and... And and try and see what was uh, <laughs> what was up there uh, the hard way. Had didn't even have a finder scope. And then of course later on I sold telescopes for many years. I sold them in the early '80s when Halley's Comet came around. I've uh, I've owned just about many different types of telescopes you could possibly think of, and I've been doing this ever since. So I know a lot about what to avoid, especially when I'm when I'm trying to. Um, sell somebody a telescope or recommend a telescope for someone to buy because I'm very adamant that people don't spend too much money on what they on what they're doing and so what they're trying to get so that's sort of why I'm doing this this hangout series all right so let's talk so let me look at some of the uh oh uh, toxic you're in uh you're in uh twitch it's good to see you so please and also jsk oh, what is they're trying to get so that's sort of why I'm doing this this hangout series. what's happening here all right Ooh, uh, Facebook just came online for some reason, so there was some feedback. Um, okay, so uh, let's get started on on, t let, on how to get started. Who wants to go first, John or Adam? You want to talk to somebody about what would you recommend for getting started? Go ahead, Adam. My biggest piece of advice for anyone looking to get into astronomy, amateur astronomy, is simply to go outside as much as they can. Go and look at the night sky. When it's clear, if the weather's clear and you can see things in the sky, spend your time going out, finding the planets. You can find Jupiter at the moment. You can find Saturn with your eyeballs. You don't need a telescope just yet. You can see Venus in the morning. You can see the moon and you can find your way around the night sky, begin to learn the constellations. You can find the Big Dipper in uh, some major from there you can find the pole star you can find the uh w of cassiopeia andromeda the, the square of pegasus so you can learn the night sky because it these are that's a big skill that you'll need if you're going to buy a telescope you need to uh, know where to look obviously that's okay that's that's good well, if you don't like spending time outside looking at the night sky, don't buy a telescope. Yeah, uh, that's, that's good. Some, that's good advice. I just got through for some reason. I always get a phone call right when the hangouts start. I don't know why they do that. Um, yeah, so go outside and just look up is a great, great piece of advice. John, you got anything to add to that? Well, no. Um, learning the night sky is uh, an important part of astronomy. Um, like uh, Adam said. Um, it helps <clears throat> to find the um, various objects. You, you know, if you can't, if you don't know where Cygnus is, or what time of the year Cygnus uh, rises, then um, you know you're pretty stuck. That's the summer triangle right now. You can find the uh, Cygnus, Deneb, the star Cygnus. That's the the primary star in Cygnus. Is part of the uh, summer triangle that you can find very easily. Vega, 
is one of the brightest stars in the sky. Deneb and Altair is the other one. Okay, yep. Yeah. And I just want to I want to point something out. So I went and I got up. Um, I have one of these, and I don't know if uh, you guys have probably seen these. They're very inexpensive. Uh, they're called planospheres, and mine is very old. In fact, it's so old that it falls apart. So I, what I do is, because it's a, a vintage one, I leave it hanging up. I just took it off of my bookcase just now, and this is what I used when I was in high school to find this to find those constellations that are up there. And all you don't need anything else but this. And what it has is a is a is a disc in here where you look and you you rotate you ro you can rotate this. I can't do it very well, but you match up the date of where you're going up outside. Let's say it's uh, it's, it's February, well, whatever the date is. You would set up today's date, and there would be a there's a uh, there's a time of day uh, along this outside here, and so you match the time of day that you're going out with the date that you're up, and what what'll appear in this circle are things that are up in your horizon that night, and you can see them, and you and they draw the um, the constellation boundaries for you. And then you could go out and basically you hold it up like this. Okay, I'm trying to do this so you can see. You hold it up so that the disc is up in the sky and you line up north, south, east, and west. And then you can try and find like the Big Dipper would be low in the sky you would, or high in the sky depending on what time of year. And this is the best way, one of the easiest ways and the cheapest ways to find the constellations and get familiar with the night sky. So that is uh, one of the best ways you can do that, I think. So I, I wanted to, um, to, to to point that out because I agree with I agree with with Adam and John. You need to learn the night sky first one. You, you want to try and go out there and say, you, be the guy who answers the question. What's that bright thing up there? Does anybody know what that really bright thing is? is? That a planet? Is that a star? And also learn the difference between a planet and a star. And and. Adam, maybe you could tell, why don't you talk a little bit about what, how can you tell the difference at night between a planet and a star? Usually the very brightest, what look like stars are planets as a rule. If it's very bright, the brightest thing in the sky, and it's small, not like obviously the moon or the sun. Right. It will, it will be Venus <laughs> or Jupiter. It'll be a... Uh, if it has a red, if it has a red tinge to it, it's probably Mars. And if it's really big and doesn't twinkle, that's usually what I say to a lot of people. I was about to say that, um, Sonny. Yeah, go ahead. I was just about to say that. If it, don't, if it doesn't twinkle, it's a planet. Right. And why is that, John? Why don't they twinkle? Well, stars are points of light. Planets are um, disks. No matter how small they are, they still um, appear as a disk. And a disk doesn't twinkle. Ah, and Robert Palmer has also got a great suggestion in the chat. He sees right. He's saying, "Be patient and allow at least thirty minutes for your eyes to adapt to use averted vision." And um, that's that's also good advice. It takes a long time before uh, you go out from a bright, a brightly lit room. You go out into the backyard. It's hard to see things. It's really hard to see anything, right? Oh, it's yeah. Just, yeah. And, you, and, and you need somewhere dark. Well, you need somewhere away from street lights away from security lights. Yeah, but that's not practical, you, is it? I mean, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I've lived in a lot of cities, and you just... Sometimes it's it's lucky. You're lucky if you can even see the stars of the Big Dipper. It really sucks. But if you can go out and drive out of the city, then, yeah, you really... Unfortunately, it's just the reality we live in, isn't it? Yeah. No, you don't have to go out with a really dark sight, uh, sky sight, but uh, if you're thinking of buying a telescope and... Just think about where you're going to set it up. You need to, an unobstructed view of the sky, and it has to be fairly dark for you to be able to see anything. Yep. And uh, so, okay, so that's that's our first piece of advice. Get out there, learn the night sky. It doesn't cost a dime uh, to do that unless you want to buy one of these planospheres, and it might cost you 9 or 10 bucks, or I don't know what they are in the UK, the UK maybe... Uh, maybe. 15. There are some good apps as well, Tony. Oh, I was going to get to that, but I wanted to get this is just really super low tech, and I had it hang it handy, so I wanted to I wanted to talk about that. Um, those you can order from um, uh, Sky Intel as well. Oh, which by the way, let me just do this real quick. Um, this is another resource for getting started in um, in amateur astronomy. So I'm sharing my screen, 
and I want you to see right here. This is one of the best resources you're ever going to see. Let me just uh, let me go to this side. Sorry, um, Sky and Telescope magazine. If you don't subscribe to this magazine, I would highly recommend you do. But if you don't, you can just go to the website and see some of the things they've got. One of their most valuable features is a thing called, if you click on the observing link, it takes you to this page, which is full of uh, stuff that's up tonight. He, and this is, this is edited by a guy named Alan McRobert, which does a great, who does a great job of telling you what's up every single month. And they have, it has a little a chart in here. And uh, it also has, they, they have printed, I don't have it handy right now, but they also have in the print version of the magazine a, um, a, a little planisphere for that month so that you can take the magazine outside and, and do what I just said with this, with this planisphere. So um, that's another highly uh, valuable resource, the Sky and Tell magazine. Definitely check it out. Again, it costs of a subscription. And if you don't... If you don't get what we're trying to get to here, it, 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 we're trying not to um, get you to spend a lot of cash, at least not at first, right? Um, right, guys? Would you agree with that? Definitely, yeah. So, I mean, don't, don't, what, I, what I really don't like to see are people just getting started and they, um, uh, they, 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 they spend way too much money on things they don't know how to use. So just hold on to your money. Get familiar with the night sky. Make sure you want to use it. Uh, and and uh, another good way of learning the night sky, is, as Adam was suggesting, was apps. You want to talk about those, uh, Adam? I don't particularly have any favorite apps. These are uh, things you can put on your phone. Them. Now there used there used to yeah. be a, there used to be a thing. Huh? I know there are lots of good apps. It, I, I I would say it's a a question of individual uh, preference. You know, I wouldn't like to endorse any particular app i will i'll endorse some there was one <laughs> there was one that i downloaded from celestron it's free it was available for google and um i should have i should have had my phone here but i try to keep it away from me when i'm doing hangouts uh the, the it, it's from celestron you can get it from both google i'm sorry google play and uh itunes and it, it's a really good app for you know seeing what's up at night um and it also has the ability to control your telescope from the app, but which we'll get into later. But but um, for now, what you need to know is that it, 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 you can you can hold it up and you can see what's up at night uh, as well. Do you guys remember something called Google Sky? Or it was yeah. a Sky yeah. Map. It was yeah. Sky Map or something like that. It used to be an app that you could hold up your, to the phone to the sky, and it would show you what it is. Do you guys? I can't find that anymore. Is that still around? I never I looked, know, to be quite honest. I know exactly what you mean. <clears throat> but it, yeah, it was like uh, when, when the smartphones first came out, Google had this really cool thing where you held your phone up to something at the sky, whatever it was. Let's say it was the moon, and it would show you the moon. It would say, this is the moon. Or you would you could move it over and see uh, another bright dot and say, oh, that's Jupiter. And it would just show up right in your phone. But um, that's kind of... That's kind of a lazy way to learn the night sky, but it was really cool, I thought. Uh, but, I, but I don't know whatever happened to that. I tried to find it the other day just so I could do this hangout, and I can't find it. So it's, uh, it's weird. People are saying in the chat there are uh, Skyview, skymaps.com. There are, there are a few of them. Well, okay, so Dano, yeah, Skyview. Um, that one I haven't Bar heard. Chart. Yeah. All right, so in this day and age, there's lots of ways to get familiar with the night sky. So, um, oh, so I think we've we made that point. We really like to get people used to the Google Sky is part of Google Earth. That's true, Astro B. But um, is there an app? Is, do you know that app I was talking about? Is what I guess I'm getting at. You could hold your phone up, and it would. And well, I think we um, the phone version of Stellarium did that as well. What version? The, the um the telephone version, mobile phone version of Stellarium. I didn't know there was a, a mobile version of that. Oh yes, it, instead of being free, it's um about two three pound, maybe about four or five dollars. Wow. Okay. But if you if you use it on your um, um on the Windows tablet or um, computer, it's a free download. Okay. Um, yeah, and we're getting some comments from um, the uh, 
so JSK on, on Skype, or I'm sorry, on Twitch is saying, I still use SkyMap. So it was SkyMap. That was it. Okay, so, um, and, and, and <laughs> Ho Muffin, sorry, I, I, I'm laughing at your handle there, um, on, on Twitch is also saying, definitely look into your local astronomy club. So let's talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about astronomy oh, clubs. Um, absolutely. Do you guys belong to ones out in, in the UK? Um, I belong to three. You belong? Well, three in, three in theory, two in um, uh, practical terms. <laughs> what does that mean? I don't go to one of them. Oh, you don't go to one of them. Which ones, which ones do you go to, John? Um, the East Riding Astronomers, um, the North Links Astronomy, and um, there's one in Buff as well, which I can't remember the name of. Okay. But, um, yeah, I, I should go to that there, to that other one as well. Yeah. yeah. There's a, there is a fourth one, um, Holland District Astronomy, but they're more talk and less observing, and I joined them to be observing. So what do you guys do? I mean, what is, what is a meeting about? You go to a meeting and what? Um, in one of them. Oh, so, oh, sorry, it can be on, Adam. Go ahead, Adam. Yeah. I was just going to say that in my experience... Amateur astronomers are very, very nice people. You don't meet, you know, wankers. So, so don't be... <laughs> well, that's... <laughs> you don't. Yeah, well, good, no astronomers, wankers, that's, that's good. <laughs> astronomers are, you know, the loveliest people you will ever meet, and they will offer you really great advice. They're happy to talk to you about, you know, if you have... If you want to know which telescope to buy, go and talk to people that already own telescopes because they'll offer you great advice. <laughs> That's right. They usually they that and I, I'll get away from the uh, uh, the wanker statement, but I didn't find it fun. It was funny. Uh, you're right, though. The um, the the. That's a great point. When you go, it it can be intimidating to walk into a room of people you don't know, and not knowing anything about the hobby that you're trying to uh, understand or get or, or learn about. Um, but Adam's point's well taken. You you're not going to get. I, I've never seen an amateur astronomy club that was standoffish or or um, what what's some of the other you know you know what I mean just distant or non-inclusive they they're very good people um and then a lot of and a lot of people just want to show up and, and share their kid their kindred spirits they just want to um share their interest and love for the night sky with every anybody and everybody who will listen so that they love it when new people walk in and they recognize you right away and a lot of people will introduce yourself like um i was at, when i was in denver i went to the denver astronomical society many years ago and they held their meetings at the chamberlain observatory in downtown denver and i would show up and i would feel intimidated because i was just some kid and i didn't know who i was but they actually took me out they showed me how to use the refractor that was there they showed me how to use all their they had their telescope set up outside they had an interesting talk usually they have a, sometimes maybe you guys astronomy clubs are different john and adam but mine had there was always one where there was a talk and you listen to somebody give a little brief presentation and then you go out and you just look through other people's telescopes and it was great it's a great way to learn about what not only what other equipment's out there but, but how, how hard it is to use and things like that would you guys agree yeah, yeah. absolutely you yeah you don't actually need to buy a telescope you can go and use someone else's and see if you like it and and do you uh so do you go to one adam regularly i do i go to one in cleforks in lincolnshire it's a few miles from me how does it work out there do you guys as clubs meet in a you guys have lots of fields and, and things where you guys can meet but do, or do you go to observatories there's an observatory close to where I live. Uh, it's the built on the highest point for miles around. It's a small amateur observatory with a Newtonian telescope. So it's a it's a person a privately owned observatory. Yeah. And you guys meet yeah. there. Yeah, once oh. a month usually. Yeah, that's yeah, and um, that's another thing. The frequency of how often they meet is pretty different. How about yours, John? You have three. Well, how often do they meet? Um, meet. We meet uh, once a month. Um, the the um, East Riding Astronomy, we, we sit down and have a meeting. Um, cup of tea, biscuits, it's common with um, every astronomy group. 
Um, and if it's um, clear outside, we take our, tele our telescopes out and have a look through them. The other one, though, Lynx Astronomy, um, we, we have um, a talker, someone who comes up, comes out to um, give a talk to us every uh, meeting. And I actually start off the talk myself with um, a small five, five or ten minute um, news item, latest news in um, astronomy and um, space exploration. If someone there comes on to give his talk, and then um, again, if it's um, if the stars are out, we'll go outside our telescopes and just waste our time there. We can just call it waste. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, the the uh, the, in, uh, the one here, for for example, you know, I, like I said, the, I went to astronomy clubs when I was a lot younger, and then of course I worked in astronomy for thirty years or something like that. God, I'm feeling old. Thanks for letting me uh, tell me <laughs> for talking about how old we are, guys. I'm really glad we we started to hang out off of that. Um, but the um, so working in astronomy for thirty years, I didn't really get involved in a lot of astronomy clubs, but now. I've just moved to Central Florida, but well, I've been here about three years, and I'm going to um, join the, or I'm going to go start hooking up with the Central uh, Florida Astronomers Society, and in fact, I hope to have one of the co-hosts be from there, but he couldn't do it. I may try and get some of the members to join us from those from that astronomy club as well, or I may do some live streaming from there in future hangouts. So um, anyway, I'm just going to show up and start talking to people and see what they've got. Unfortunately, though, we're in the summertime, and this is kind of a seasonal hobby. Wouldn't you guys agree? Yes. Yeah. Dark. Okay. Let me just let me qualify that. Dark sky observing is kind of seasonal because it doesn't even get dark where you guys are until like eleven o'clock, right? Well, that's right. Um, eleven o'clock at night, I you know take the dog out, and it's still blue. The sky. It doesn't really. It doesn't really get dark. Um, throughout the, um, at any time during the night um, in the UK at this time of year. Yeah, and here in Florida, it gets about uh, dark about nine nine fifteen or so. So yeah, but so what? All of that is to say that on a weeknight, especially if you've got to work the next day, it's difficult to get outside and observe the night sky. But and, and also in the northern hemisphere, there's a lot of thunderstorms. At least where I live in the afternoon, we get a lot of thunderstorms and rain clouds, and so. There's a lot of moisture in the atmosphere. There's a lot of um, clouds at night. So the summertime really sucks. But here in Florida, where, where it really shines is um, winter. Winter is one, some of the best observing ever. And I think that's true out there in the UK, right? Absolutely, yeah. 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 I mean, uh, get, get stuck by about 5, 6 o'clock mid, midwinter. Do you have a guess, John, if you had to guess how... Because what I'm surprised about is just how vibrant the amateur community is in the UK. Um, how many night, clear nights on average, maybe as a function of percentage, would you say you have clear skies out there? This is England. I know. Zero. That's, <laughs> zero. No, it can't be zero because nobody would do it then. Nobody would. Uh, I know for a fact it's not zero. But would it be like 20%, 30% of the nights? Um... What do you say, Adam? I would say completely clear nights are very rare. You, you, we have a lot of partially cloudy nights where you can see the stars, but there is cloud constantly streaming across the sky. So it, it's difficult. It's challenging, but it's fun as well. Do you agree with that, John? I mean, as far as the map cover? Yes. Yeah. Absol absolutely, totally clear skies. Um, where is Rocking Horse Teeth? All right, so Sorry, Rocking Horse, um, sh 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 yes, yeah, yeah. So Tim, <laughs> Tim Ham is commenting. Fortunately, we rarely have we rarely have to contend with rain in the UK. Would you agree with that? <laughs> <laughs> you must be living in another part of um, the world called the UK than everybody else. Yeah, it's a different UK. <laughs> Uh, Astro B's commenting it will be longer nights after the solstice tomorrow. Is tomorrow the solstice? Yeah, it is. What is today? Mm. Today is the today. 20. Oh my gosh, it is the solstice. So, who wants to tell us what the solstice is? You guys have one of you guys can do that. Oh, not me. I might get it wrong. Uh, Adam, you are uh, John, you want to you want to do it? Um something to do with the druids. 
the t- <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So the solstice has to do with the longest day of the year approaching. We are approaching the longest day of the year, meaning that on that day, there will be no longer day for the rest of the year. And anything after that, will the days will start to get shorter. And we have two solstice. We have a winter and a summer solstice. And we have two equinoxes, which are uh, spring and summer equinox. These are period. These are places in our orbit where all kinds of cool things happen. In a summer solstice, the days are longer. In a winter solstice, the days are the shortest. And in the two equinoxes, the days are at 12 hours each, exactly the same time. So that's kind of cool. Uh, so tomorrow is the summer solstice, meaning we have the longest day of the year. And everything after that, the days are just going to get shorter and shorter. Um, and um, Chuck Rittersdorf, if you're in Ultrecht, the, Nether- the Netherlands, go to the Sonnenborg Observatory. They have a nice little telescope, and during the day they point it at the sun for live sunspot viewing. Yes, uh, that's good advice, and we're going to be doing some of that here on these hangouts. Um, I have the only, I, I actually don't have very many telescopes, but I want to I segue into our telescopes now. Um, you have Philip W., as you run the risk of, of having the guards called because of reports of people in fields staring at the sky. <laughs> okay. Um, so the... Okay, so let's let's move into telescopes a little bit now, guys. I want to want to we we sh, we should mention something about some beginner telescopes. But before I do that, why don't we talk about the kind of scopes we own right now? And I'll start with you, Adam. What do you, what kind of scopes do you have? At home, a, a very old telescope that is so embarrassing I'm not prepared to show anyone it. <laughs> but I I have a a, a share in a, a big. Uh, 1.2 meter Nato- Newtonian telescope, and I will try and do some live streaming from there if we get some good weather. You, some you, you bought that with a, a group of other people? Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. And uh, anything else? <clears throat> no. I uh, most of the astronomy stuff I do at the moment is online. I must admit. So I, I don't tend to do a lot of uh, observing with a telescope at the moment. That's an important point. Um, In this day and age, we can do a lot of astronomy, really important astronomy, uh, from our desktops. And we're going to be having a lot of uh, conversations about that in the future ones. I I call them citizen science. Is that what you're referring to, doing citizen science? Or are you talking about doing something else? No, I mean, I, I look at space telescope images. Right, okay. Uh, so you pro- you download and process the images yourself? Yeah. Yeah, I do. That is a, that is becoming more and more um, uh, a big thing now. And, and what's great is that all of this data is free and available to the public. And so we ought to have some Hangouts guys where we talk about how we do that as well, how to get the data, how to process it, and things like that. Um, okay, well, let's see. Where, where was I going with that? Oh, John, let's talk about your telescopes. Yeah, I've got four main telescopes that I use. There's another three that are don't. And you can show your screen, right? Or can you? Um, yep, if I can remember. <laughs> um, I'll go through them in turn, shall I? Yep, any way you want. Yeah. Right, there's um, this... Let's see. Uh... Yeah, this one, if, when it comes up, if it comes up. This one is the, sm- the smallest of my telescopes. It's a little Celeste One D seventy travel scope. Now I bought this one. Um it's because I wanted a telescope that was small enough to just take out, plonk on the floor and do some uh, quick observing through. Um as you see a bit later, my big telescope is heavy, awkward to um take out and takes time. So but, um, this is a seventy millimeter telescope which is for a sorry Adam? Can you explain what the aperture is and what that uh, means? Yes, um, yeah, the, the, the D70, um, the 70 millimeter um, front lens, um, the focal length of this um, telescope is 400 millimeters, which makes it um, 70, uh, 400 divided by 70, 
is a 5.7, which is a nice bright image. Gives you a nice bright image there. Now for so that's the that's the focal ratio, John, the F number. Yeah. Yeah. So can we yeah. explain what the, that is? Uh, the yeah. the focal. Go, go ahead. Yeah, the the, the, sh the smaller the focal, the F, uh, the, sorry, the, the shorter the F number, in this case F 5.7, the brighter the image will be that you see. So the long, obviously, right. the longer the F um, number, or the bigger the F number, the dimmer it will be. Well, and, and it's also a, a function of uh, field of view. So uh, a, a short F number will give you a much air bigger area of the sky. Uh, yeah. As well, as well as being brighter, like you mentioned. So yeah. Okay. So to get that uh, f number, you divide the focal length by the power of the eyepiece. Yeah. No, it's the focal length by the Diam um, di diameter of the front um, lens. Right. Okay. So in the case of a Newtonian telescope, the um, diameter of the main mirror. Right. Yeah, so I don't want to get too much into that yet, but let's see. Let's, let's see the next scope you got. I'll just um, bring that one up. Um, next one in size. Can you see that? Yeah. Change. Yeah, we'll scooch ah. it. Maybe scooch it. Yeah, there you go. That's good. Um, optic star. Hey, I see one or two. It's a um, hundred and two millimeter uh, diameter um, lens on the front of it. Um, a focal length, I work out at 673 millimetres, giving a, an F number of 6.6. .6. So it's um, slightly darker than the D70, but 102 um, millimetre mirror, um, sorry, lens, um, you could, these on, these, yeah, it's a very good um, telescope. This is probably the one I use uh, most now. Now this is a refractor. We'll talk about the difference between refractors and reflectors maybe in the next hangout. But uh, this, uh, but this is a refractor, right? That's right. Yes, yeah. and it's not an expensive one. Um, in the UK, you can buy this for about um, one hundred and seventy pounds. Really? That's not bad at all. Well, that's very good. It's not, and the image, the, the view from it, it's only a singlet. There's only one um, um, lens grouping. Um, you can get doublets and you can get triplets, which um, reduce um, chromatic aberration. Having said that, through this telescope, um, chromatic aberration is minimal. Okay, don't don't go too much into those uh, terms <laughs> yet. But yeah, yeah, yeah okay. okay. What well, do you have? Another one to show us? Uh, yes, um, the next one up in size is this one. The um, Skywatcher 127 Maxitoff Cassegrain. Okay. Actually, I should have shown you the, the, um, the big one first. But this is a hybrid, if you like, between um, a refractor and a reflector. Okay. It's got a lens at the front and mirrors inside, which, um, which shorten the overall length of the telescope. As you can see, this is um, an F11.8 telescope. With a focal length of one one and a half meters, so if it wow. if it was um, a normal Newtonian reflector, it would be one and a half meters in length. Right, and that we're gonna and I want to go into these different designs too, but unfortunately, I just want to talk about the kinds of scopes we have right now. So, do you have any more? Yeah, one more, and that is me biggie. Yeah, biggie. <laughs> okay. This oh. is a this is a one that made me want to buy something smaller. What is that? That's a Newtonian, <laughs> right? That's right. It's um, two hundred millimeter um, main the primary mirror, a focal length of one thousand meters, um, one thousand meters, one thousand millimeters, <laughs> um, giving f five. Um, it's oh. heavy. It's awkward. The mount is heavy. I haven't shown the um, counterweights on that. They're heavy. It takes about half an hour to put this up. Um, so you don't, you don't, you don't leave it set up all the time. Then you, you take it down when you're done. Uh, yeah, you have to take it down. Yeah. But you know, but you can guarantee you, it's a nice starry night. 
you decide to, um, to are, to are you setting out. that up on your uh, is that on your deck do you have a deck in the back um no that's just a driveway okay so it's on concrete so, yeah I'll so, okay yeah it's um it's either on a concrete base so in the get in the um garden on the mud okay all right well it's um all right, well, to the mud. all right jsk you gotta go thanks for watching i appreciate your being here uh we'll catch us next week uh we'll be back so um okay good do you have anything else for us john Oh, no, that's only telescopes, I'm afraid. Okay, no, that's all. That's plenty. <laughs> that's what I wanted to see. <laughs> all right, good. Well, um, so the the only I I've had scopes from forever, and I I I've had everything from um, old Celestron eight telescopes, uh, Schmidt Cassegrains to you know, like I said, the the uh, the Dynascope, the RV six, the Criterion RV six, Newtonian things like that. But right now, one of the only telescopes I still have is this one. This is a uh, AstroScan 2001. I bought it when Halley's Comet came around in '84, and it cost me $329 when I back in '84. And I don't know that they still make them. I can't find them anywhere. But that's one of my favorite scopes, and my favorite scope because I can grab it like this. I can pick it up. I can take it outside. I can put it on the hood of my car, and I'm observing in five minutes. And I'm looking at all kinds of things. And these are. It's only a four-inch telescope. Um, so I don't get a lot of bright images. Uh, it's a, it's a Newtonian. That little piece of glass there isn't a lens. It's just a, a piece of glass and to protect sort of the, the, the primary mirror in there. But I have dropped that telescope. I have carried it with me as luggage, uh, hand a carry on luggage at a, on an airplane. So it has been a great many places. And I also have, but I don't have it in front of me, a uh, Coronado personal solar telescope, which I bought for $500, uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, to look at the sun in and we're going to talk about solar observing because we've got a solar eclipse coming up in august and i want to definitely be able to help people get set up for that over the coming weeks so those are our telescopes folks and we are going to share a lot of our knowledge with you about what we do with them and, and what kind you should get we already touched on a lot of the um some of the technical stuff i mean they were talking about focal ratios and things like that we're going to talk about what that means and why they're importance um going forward but uh uh there's a lot to learn and we're hopefully we're going to help you do that as we go on um i guess what i'd like to talk about before we with the time we've got left guys is what about what about binoculars do you guys have any binoculars oh yes i've got four of those as well okay why are they great and what can you see with them um, well, they're great because you can just take them outside, um, and within seconds you're looking up at the stars, doing proper stargazing. Um, yeah. the, the most common uh, for um, astronomy are between seven by fifty, seven times magnification, fifty uh, millimeter uh, front lens elements, and uh, ten by fifty. Um, they're nice to, uh, yeah, they're easy to handhold. Um, and, and they are useful, especially for things like um, meteor showers. Yeah, they are. Uh, they're very wide field. They have the advantage of the use hold them. You know how to use them. One look, you know how to use them. That's why I also like this this telescope. One look at it, you know how to use it. There's no no instruction manual. You really need to, to learn. So binoculars are great for that. Um, and like, like John was saying, they have two numbers associated with them, 7 by 50s 11 by 70s, uh, 5 by 30s. That first number is the magnification, which we'll talk about in future Hangouts. And that second number is the diameter in millimeters of the objective lenses, each one. So uh, a, a 7 by 50 has a magnification of 7 power with the diameter of each of their little objective lenses at 70 millimeters. So, if you um, don't have a lot of money, um, don't buy a cheap telescope buy a good pair of binoculars what do you mean by that you mean uh they, you mean a good pair of binoculars would cost about the same as a cheap telescope yeah yeah and do you have any uh most, most, cheap, most cheap telescopes are rubbish don't yes. ever buy one from a supermarket yeah, one of, the, one of the the topics of our hangout is going to be cheap versus inexpensive. <laughs> there's a value, there's a value purchase, and then there's the cheap crap that you want to stay away from. So we'll help you with that as well. Yeah, and you can buy a good pair of binoculars instead of wasting your money on a an inexpensive telescope. 
you can do more with binoculars. The, the, you get uh, your view is the right side up. Oh, that's, that's another important good. point. When you look through a telescope, the image is upside down unless you buy something called an image erector, which um, sounds strange, but basically it turns it right side up. But uh, because of the way the optical path is, the image appears upside down in the eyepiece. So that's a good point. Yeah, it's very disconcerting to look through a pair of binoculars and have everything be upside down. So yeah, they turn it right side up for you. So that's a good point. Uh, Ho Muffin is commenting, Deep Astronomy, the guy who made the original uh, Astro, or the guy who made the original just kickstarted AstroScan 2.0. I did not know that. We should go check that out. The AstroScan was a really popular telescope back in the day. Could you guys get those in the UK? Did you guys remember those? You don't remember? Um, them? You don't remember seeing anything like this? Oh yes, um, actually, one of the astronomy clubs had one of them, but it broke. Oh okay, yeah. But he couldn't, he couldn't get it fixed, so he, I think we burnt it. <laughs> you burnt it? <laughs> oh okay, well fine. But, but um, aside from that, will make it into a kind of tandoori um, oven, but <laughs> tandoori oven. Well, this. Uh, I, I guess that is a disadvantage to this telescope, is if it breaks, uh, fixing it's made of plastic, so uh, if it breaks, it's going to be um, hard to fix. But I, like I said, I've treated, I've dropped it and treated it pretty roughly, and it's still held in there. So um, it had the it had the nice um, fact uh, virtue of being inexpensive and, and relatively high quality optics. So I like that. Uh, Ho Muffin is commenting, buy once, cry once. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> the point being, you don't want to buy too much uh, and, and you know, get buyer's remorse or um, buy something that you hate and never use again. So, all right. Well, let's see. So where should we go from here, guys? You guys have anything else you want to add about getting, um, getting started in, ast in, in amateur astronomy? I would say to... Uh... To anyone who's looking to buy a telescope, just to take the time, look at as many adverts, brochures, places online as they can find. Take your time, look at as many different places. Go to a, a decent retailer. Don't be afraid to ask them questions because that's what they're there to do. What do you mean by do, a decent retailer? What, we'll give, a, give, give a UK an example and I'll try to give one for US. John? Uh, Harrison Telescopes and um, another one, First first Light Optics. They both come uh, very highly recommended. Yeah, in America, I would recommend Astronomics. They're a good, they're a good company. Uh, they're really highly, highly reg regarded. Also, Orion Telescopes and Telescopes dot com uh, is a really good. Uh, uh, they don't nothing they sell. I think is junk. I think they sell a lot of good stuff. So, and they have uh, ways you can you know talk to somebody online and and uh, get get advice, so. And also, it's um, another reason for joining um, an, an astronomy club is not not just to meet people, not just to learn stuff, but you also get the chance to buy stuff. True. There are people selling things. And my like, th um, well, um, of those four telescopes I showed you, the only, big, the only one that, that was bought brand new was that biggie, the Skywatcher 200P. Um, that cost um, at the time for uh, over four hundred pounds. My second telescope, because I wanted something smaller, was the um, Celestron D seventy. It's a good tiny one that cost me twenty five pounds. Do you get the lesson no. there, folks? So John started with a really large telescope, and then goes, "Wow, this thing is really a heavy. really big goat that's <laughs> too bloody big." <laughs> And then he gets himself a small one so that it's easy to set up outside. <laughs> the next one I bought was the um, Scout 127, the little blue one. That cost me £25. Yeah. Retail price at the time was £225. That's really good advice, going to yeah, checking out your astronomy club. Because one of the things that you're going to do if you get into astronomy or amateur astronomy, we all do this, is we end up just buying stuff. We just buy, buy, buy. And we end up, then before we know it, we got a lot of stuff. We want to buy more things, but now we want to sell some of our old stuff to get the new stuff. And so you see a lot of people giving pretty good deals to their buddies um, for other telescopes. So that's good advice. That really is. Um, all right. Anything else you want to want to mention, guys, about getting star started? parties? What are they? Go to a... Oh, yes, star parties. Go to a star party. 
well, what do you, what are those and how do you go to one and, and is there drinking involved? Yes, it's basically it's it, well, they're definitely <laughs> drinking involved. People with a, people with telescopes getting together to look at the night sky and get drunk. That's what it is in England, anyway. <laughs> in great the, fun, great fun. They are, and uh, one of the uh, so basically a star party is just where a bunch of people get together with telescopes. They set them up. You can look up. You can look through. Uh, usually, it's overnight. Now there's some. F- there's some famous ones here in the U.S. One of them was a Texas star party that was, it's been going for decades. And you could go, you bring your telescopes, you, you, you camped overnight for a weekend, and you looked at just, you know, just amazing array of, of optical uh, uh, equipment. And what I like about those the most is that I may be thinking about buying something, but I don't because I want to see what it's like on, you know, what someone else has, how it works for them and what kind of, you know, if they buy a new accessory or if they bought a new telescope, I actually will get a chance to look through it before I decide if I want to spend my money on it. So I like star parties and, and astronomy clubs for that reason. But astronomy clubs are a little different. Usually they're more structured. The meetings, they'll be observing but there's usually a, like a talk or, you know, some kind of structure to the meeting itself. A star party is much different where you can just go out and have fun. So that's a good point. Um, so let's see here. I'm trying to go through some. Did you guys see anything in the chat we should bring up? Toxic Vamp is going, I found a cool project on Reddit for someone with a huge Dobsonian. A Dobsonian is a style of telescope that we'll talk about. Built himself a small shed for it and it runs on wheels to move into the yard for viewing very nice makes it easy john i know you want to say something about dobsonians go ahead they don't exist they are newtonians <laughs> on the dobsonian mount that's his that's his thing I, I, the first time i talked to john he's like i just want to say there's no such thing as a dobsonian and i i beg to differ but he we clarified there's a it's a mount it's a mount style dob john and it was named after a man named john dobson uh, Astro B is commenting Harrison telescopes and first light optics. Is that a UK thing? Yeah. yeah. Well, first light optics. Yeah, they, they they sell some very good. They got they do very good deals on statoscopes. Okay. Uh, and but but um, one thing I want to say: a seventy millimeter front diameter for a refractor is the absolute minimum you should be looking for. Why is that? Anything short, anything smaller than that, it's it's going to be disappointing. You mean as far as uh, image brightness? Yes, and uh, okay. the amount you can see, and um, trying to um, split like um, um, binaries, okay. binary stars. Okay. Um, that's yeah, that's good advice. And also, somebody was in in here saying that uh, Patrick Moore used to recommend. Uh, five by what was it? Five by oh shoot, I lost the comment. Oh, ten by fifty binoculars, ten power with fifty millimeter, um, fifty millimeter lenses. The only problem with that advice, I think, is ten power binoculars are very difficult to hold steady. Um, there, if you as you're holding them up to your eyes, they you can see all the all the jitter. Ten power is about the most you can hold with your hands and still see something. You want to stabilize it on something anything larger than that. Um, but even for me, I, I have a hard time looking through ten power binoculars. Uh, Astro B, you can so you can watch satellites in the and the ISS with binoculars. Do you know? This is what I love about the UK. First time I ever saw the International Space Station was in South Shields, and it was with a pair of binoculars. It was gorgeous. It was lovely. I love it up there. Um, okay. So I guess what I'd like to do before we stop this hangout, because we're at an hour now, is I want to get, please, I want to invite you guys to leave us your feedback. Tell us what you thought about this hangout. Leave comments below uh, in the hangout section below on all of the platforms that we're streaming on. If you want to see a certain direction for these hangouts, please let us know. We'll make sure to cover it. I think next time what I would like to do, and Adam and and, uh, John, you guys tell me if you disagree. I'd like to talk a little bit about the telescope... um, uh, telescope types, refractors versus reflectors, and then I want to get into a little bit of what we were talking about today, F ratios, um, diameter, why is diameter so great, and why is magnification not so great, um, things like that. What do you guys think? Well, that's, oh, yeah, that suits okay. me fine. All right. There's a lot, a lot of people think, well, 
start off. A lot of people think that high magnification must need high magnification, and you don't. No, it's a myth. Yeah. It's a myth. You don't really want a lot of high magnification. We'll talk about why you don't want that in future hangouts. And we'll also talk about the different factors that affect magnification. You've got a telescope. It's got a certain diameter mirror. It's got a certain focal length. That inherently has its own magnification. But when you put eyepieces in and Barlow lenses and all kinds of things, you can change all of those parameters. So we'll talk about what all that means. But I think next time we'll talk about the difference between a refractor and a reflector and why, what the strengths and weaknesses are of each one. Refractors are almost always more expensive than reflectors, but we'll talk about that next time. Before we go, though, I want to just mention, I want to try with each Hangout to talk about a book. I have a lot of books back there. And, uh, and John and, and Adam, I invite you to recommend books as well. This is written by a, a friend of mine, Carol uh, Collins-Peterson. Carolyn Collins-Peterson. And you can buy this I know book. Carolyn. You know Carolyn. So she wrote this book. Uh, I've, known her, I've known her for years. Uh, this what's it's called Astronomy 101. You can buy it on Amazon. Um, I think I put a link in the description box, but if I didn't, just do a, a, a quick search on Amazon and it'll come up. Uh, what I love about this book is that it is it's got sections on everything from planets to Pluto to um, it, you know uh, the birth of Saturn. It has a whole section on asteroids and what my favorite section. There's a great explanation in here on gravitational lenses, what they are and why they matter, uh, what they do for us. Uh, there's a section here on uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, talks about its history and uh, some of the um, uh, trials and tribulations that it went through. This book is awesome for somebody who just wants to learn about different astronomical topics. What are uh, gamma ray bursts? What are black holes? What are wormholes? Uh, the, the, there's little sections in here on all of this, and it's easy to read and easy to digest. And she wrote this book way before Neil deGrasse Tyson wrote his book that just came out, which was Astrophysics for People in a Hurry or something like that. So this book, highly recommended. It's on Amazon. I don't make a thing for doing it. She's just a good friend of mine, and it's a great book. So um, I wanted to, to point you in that direction. And I'm going to try with these Hangouts to have other books to um, recommend as well. And, and we, we might even review certain books if you guys want us to do that. So, guys, this is our first Hangout. What do you, th what do you think? Ad oh, Adam's got his, got his co-host there. Let me just pull him up. <laughs> oh, I like that. We got to get rid of him before I put him up. There he is. There's his co-host. <laughs> Hello, boy. Is it a boy or a girl? It's a boy. A boy. Hello, boy. Hello. Hello. <laughs> All right. Well, th I want to thank you both, Adam and John. I think we got a good good thing going here. Um, John, are you going to have a camera next time? I hope so. That's right. It should, it should have been here. Well, I was hoping to get it here uh, for today's. It's going to what? I, I was hoping that, that it would have been here for today. Right. And we're going to play around, guys, with um, some of the, the, the video chat stuff. I think next time we might do this on Skype so all three of us can be up at once and 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 have us all up right now i have to switch between john and adam because of the setup i got uh so anyway we hope you guys like this hangout please keep us uh up to date on what what you would like to see in the comments below yes i'm wearing my my newcastle football club uh <laughs> top so that's right shahid so thanks for noticing um philip w put a link up on the chat about where to get that book uh, and I, did you have a question, Glacia, that I did not get to? I think you did. I want to make sure I, I find it. Um, oh, wow, you guys were chatting a lot here. That's good. Uh, how to get a used HST. Oh, yeah. Um, don't know. Uh, go to, I guess you can go to the Institute and ask them if they're, what they're going to do with it when they're done. <laughs> um, okay, guys. Well, I guess we'll stop here. Um, I want to thank everybody. I want to thank Adam and John for taking time out each week to, to talk with you guys about amateur astronomy. We're going to go a lot further, I hope, with in-depth with these topics. Please let us know what you want to see. And um, I guess we'll stop there. So thank you all very much for watching. And as always, keep looking up. Keep looking up. Hey. <laughs> you get to say it, John Adam. That's great. <laughs>